Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. My name is Mark Lundstrom. I'm a professor at Purdue, and I'm preparing a course for Nano Hub U this fall. The course is on nanoscale transistors. What I'd like to do for the next several minutes is to tell you what the course is about and to encourage you to sign up if it's something that interests you. So the course is about transistors and transistors enable electronics. And the 20th century was really transformed by electronics and in the middle of the 20th century with the advent of microelectronics, things really took off. The result is today that we have incredibly powerful electronic systems and they're becoming more and more powerful in the 20th century. Now these electronic systems are built with electronic devices. There are many different kinds of electronic devices, but the most important device is the transistor. And the evolution of technology has taken transistors to nanoscale dimensions. It's really the first true active nanoelectronic device or nano device that we have, and it's a big success of the nanotechnology initiative. So let me give you a very brief history of electronic devices. So things really began about the beginning of the 20th century when Thomas Edison was working on electric light bulbs and he noticed something coming off the filament. Turned out that that something were cathode rays and they were electrons. And the physicist J.J. Thompson received the Nobel Prize for figuring that out. And very quickly, people turned that phenomenon into a device first into a vacuum tube diode that could rectify signals, and then by inserting a grid between the filament and the cathode, an amplifying device. And that enabled uh, electronic communication and the entertainment industry, radio, and you know things really took off at the beginning of the century. But people realized right at the beginning that vacuum tubes had a lot of problems. They consumed a lot of power, they were fragile, they burned out, you couldn't carry your radios around with you very conveniently. And it wasn't very long before people started thinking about new types of devices that would be better. The field effect transistor was actually invented early in the 20th century and patented by two different people, but it turned out to be a very difficult device to build. And this is one of the big successes then in the late 1940s on uh, directed research at Bell Labs, which led to the Nobel Prize in 1947 with the invention of the transistor. It turned out it wasn't this transistor that Bell Labs invented. Uh, it turned, a field effect transistor turns out to be very difficult to build. But along the way, they discovered a different type of transistor, the point contact transistor. And this is what led to the first electronic devices and started the transistor revolution. So this is sometimes called the greatest invention of the 20th century. And others will say, no, the greatest invention was really when people learned how to integrate these transistors onto a single chip of silicon and build hundreds, thousands, millions, and now billions of transistors on a single chip. And that's led to all of the electronics that we take for granted today. Everything from supercomputers to all of the personal electronics that we carry around. And the 21st century is going to be even more exciting and it's all enabled by nanoscale transistors. So this is a course about the physics of nanoscale transistors, about how we understand how these devices operate and what their ultimate limits might be. This is a cross-sectional scanning electron microscope of a silicon transistor. You can see it built on, on a piece of silicon, and you can see the active part of the devices. Uh, one terminal is called the source. It's very descriptive. It's a source of electrons. A second terminal is called the drain. That's where the electrons drain out. And in between is a terminal called the gate that controls the flow of electrons between the source and the drain. And if we look at the heart of the device, we can see that today we have channel lengths that are less than 100 meters long. Modern day technology currently is at 22 nanometers. We can see thin insulating layers that are only one to two nanometers thick. So this is really a true nanoscale device in every sense of the word. These types of transistors are called MOSFETs and the MOSFET is for metal. That refers to the gate, which is a metallic electrode or a semiconductor doped so heavily that it's like a metal. An oxide layer, which is a thin insulating layer that separates the gate electrode from the silicon underneath. And then the semiconductor or silicon channel. 
So it's MOS field effect transistor is the device that's driving electronics today. Now, this is the way we draw a circuit picture of a transistor. And what we're interested in is as we apply voltages to the gate, the drain, and the source, or maybe the silicon body that everything is built upon, what current flows. If we understand what current flows, then we can take this device and build electronic systems with it. So as an electrical engineer, you'd be interested in what are the current voltage characteristics. Well, if you apply a low voltage to the gate, not much current flows. We call that the subthreshold regime. You need to plot uh, the current on a log axis to see what's happening there. But if you apply a large enough gate voltage, you get larger and larger currents. And if you look at small voltages between the drain and the source terminal, the current is approximately linear. That's like the IV characteristic of a resistor. We call that the linear regime. And if you look at larger drain to source voltages, the current approximately saturates, looks more like a current source. So one of our goals in this course is going to be to understand the internal physics of how electrons and holes flow and what leads to these kinds of IV characteristics and how do we design transistors such that they have suitable IV characteristics for electronic systems. And a key tool for doing that will be drawing energy band diagrams. So this is a, actually it's a two-dimensional device on this picture, but there's a third dimension coming out. So the energy band diagrams can be quite complicated, but let's keep it simple. Just by asking, just by plotting the electron energy versus position from the source, across the channel, and out the drain. And if we do that, we can very easily see how this device operates. So the red line is the Fermi level. So those of you that are familiar with basic semiconductor physics will recall that that sort of tells us that what energy levels are the electron states filled up to. And then you can see the electron potential energy, the bottom of the conduction band in the source. You can see a big barrier that prevents them from flowing into the channel. And then the energy goes down into, into, into the drain as well. So this is plotted under a low gate voltage and no voltage applied between the drain and the source. You'll recall from freshman physics that an electrostatic potential or voltage V lowers the potential energy of electrons. So if we apply voltages to the terminals, we should expect to lower the electron's potential energy. Let's apply a voltage to the drain terminal. That'll pull the potential energy in the drain way down but electrons still can't flow from the source to the drain because there's a large energy barrier that stops them. If we now apply a high gate voltage in addition, that pulls the potential energy down in the channel. Now we have a small energy barrier between the source and the channel. Electrons can flow over that barrier and out the drain and current flows. So that's the basic physics of a transistor and it's really very simple. The design of transistors so that they have proper potential energy barriers is far from simple. And understanding the current voltage characteristics of a transistor really boils down to two things. Understanding electrostatics, solving the Laplace or Poisson equation, so that these energy barriers have the proper shapes and are controlled in the proper way. And then understanding carrier transport. How do electrons flow when the energy barrier is pushed down? And you know, it's just amazing if you look back in the early 1960s when people first developed the ability to build MOS field effect transistors and first started to think seriously about how do we understand these devices and model them, you know, there are a couple of key papers that it's really interesting to go back and read. You know, these people were incredibly bright. They didn't have sophisticated computer simulations, but they were able to figure out the essential physics and develop analytical expressions for the IV characteristics that have proven remarkably good and continue to be used today. Now, these theories were based on a theory of how electrons move through semiconductors. And the basic idea is that if we apply an electric field, you put a force on electrons and they move with some velocity, actually in the direction opposite the electric field because they have a negative charge. If the electric field is small, the average velocity is just proportional to the electric field. When the electric field gets very big, 
Electrons gain a lot of energy. They scatter in many different ways. It gets hard for them to maintain their velocity. And in silicon, the velocity saturates at about 10 to the seventh centimeters per second. Okay. So we can think of this curve as velocity is mobility, which is a property of the electric field, gets very small at very high electric fields, which causes the velocity to saturate. So this is a very physical picture of carrier transport that the early pioneers in MOS had in mind when they developed their theories. And that led to the traditional model of a MOSFET. This is a model that's still taught in almost every textbook, and many of you will be familiar with it. These are the shape of the IV characteristics that we sketched earlier. If you look at a small voltage between the drain and the source terminals, the current is proportional to the width of the transistor. That's the dimension coming out of the page from that earlier sketch that I showed you, divided by the length of the channel times mobility times the charge in the channel. And the charge is given by a very simple expression that comes from MOS electrostatics. And we'll talk quite a little, quite a lot actually about this uh, expression later in the course. Now, if I apply a large voltage, then the electrons move as fast as they can at this saturated velocity, and we get a very simple expression for the, for the current. So this is the textbook theory, and uh, many of you have seen this in introductory semiconductor courses and even in somewhat advanced semiconductor courses. But the question is, when does this simple picture of carrier transport work? And the answer is that it works if the device is long enough. In the 1960s, the devices were plenty long. Today, the devices are very, very short. So the idea is that the velocity moves in the opposite direction of the electric field. The constant of proportionality is the mobility. You might recall that there's a relation between the diffusion coefficient and the mobility given by this Einstein relation, kT over q, 0.026 volts. The mobility of a modern day MOSFET is something like 300 centimeters squared per volt second. So we can use the Einstein relation to deduce the diffusion coefficient. If we know a little bit of transport physics, we know diffusion is random thermal motion and scattering. So the diffusion coefficient is given by the average thermal velocity, V sub t, times lambda, which is the mean free path or average distance between scattering events, and there's a factor of two there. So putting this all together and knowing that the average thermal velocity is roughly 10 to the seventh centimeters per second, we can estimate the mean free path. How long do electrons move before they scatter off of something and their velocity is randomized? It's roughly 16 nanometers. Okay. You know, how long are devices these days? Modern day technology is about 22 nanometers. Same scale as the mean free path. Actually, the critical part of the channel is much, much smaller than that. So the physical assumptions that went into the theories that were developed in the 1960s and are still widely used uh, in fact, are no longer valid. We need a proper physical theory for the nanoscale MOSFET, and that's what this course is all about. Now, there are ways to treat this problem. We do sophisticated uh, computer simulations. These are some that were done a number of years ago at IBM Research. You can see the, the line with the electron's potential energy, like the one we sketched earlier. These are simulations where each dot is an electron that is tracked through a computer as it's accelerated by the electric field, scatters off of lattice vibrations, ionized impurity, surface roughness, whatever, and executes some type of random walk and goes out either the source or the drain. If I look at any position and just compute the average velocity of all of the electrons at that position, then I can plot the average velocity versus position and you might look near the drain where the electric field is very, very strong and the carriers are very energetic and say that the velocity should saturate there. But actually, if you plot the average velocity versus, versus position, you see no hint of this velocity saturation that occurs in long chunks of semiconductors, you know, on which the basic theory of the MOSFET was built. And the reason is very simple. The carriers exit the device before they have a time to scatter before they have time to scatter enough for their velocity to saturate. So this is actually a very complicated problem in carrier transport. And uh, it's 
It's uh, what we call non-local carrier transport in semiconductors. That was semi-classical transport. Every dot was an electron, but electrons are quantum mechanical particles. They're spread out. They don't have a precise location. These are simulations that comprehend quantum mechanics. And what you're seeing here is the color red indicates a high density of electrons. And you can see that electrons aren't bouncing off of the barrier or some of them are in creating interference effects, but they're also tunneling underneath. So the internal physics of these devices gets very, very complicated. You know, but what we're going to be doing in this course is, is not doing detailed, sophisticated simulations. We're going to be trying to understand what these simulations tell us and express this in a simple way so that we can understand the essential physics of these devices. And the essential physics is actually quite simple. So I like this quote from the famous physicist Eugene Wigner. When someone showed him sophisticated computer simulations, uh, he was pleased that the computer got the right answer and understood the problem, but we want to understand the problem too. So what we're going to be doing is talking about simple ways to understand concepts, understanding that has evolved over the last decade or so from doing these sophisticated simulations. Now the approach that we will take is something called the Landauer approach to transport. So this is a, this is a, a modern approach to transport theory that works very small for large, for, works very well for small devices but can also be extended to large devices. So it's a very good starting point for looking at transport in small devices. Those of you who took our first course on NanoHub U by Professor Ciprio Dada will be very, very familiar with this technique. Uh, we, will we will use this technique and apply it to nanoscale transistors. We'll talk a little bit about where it comes from, and you'll get familiar with an expression like this, which is really the starting point for understanding carrier transport for us. Current is proportional to some fundamental constants. And then the product of a transmission, a number t, which is just a number between 0 and 1, and tells us the probability that an electron that enters the source will exit the drain. A number m that tells us how many channels there are for the, for the electrons to flow at any particular energy. And then the difference in the Fermi functions between the two contacts. The only reason that they're different is if we apply different voltages to the two contacts. And that will be our starting point, and we'll see that we can understand nanoscale MOSFETs uh, very nicely based on this Landauer theory. So this Landauer theory, it really has helped us appreciate that things are different at nanoscale dimensions. And this understanding came out of some very nice work that was done in the 1980s and early 1990s on mesoscopic transport. What you're seeing here is a sketch of a very small resistor with a channel that is very short and very narrow. And actually, the width of that channel, W, can be electrically controlled by some reverse bias Schottky barriers. And if we plot the conductance of that little resistor versus the width of the channel, you would expect as it gets wider and wider that the conductance would just get higher and higher. Now, the surprise is that the conductance increases in discrete steps of 2q squared over h. So conductance is actually a quantized quantity. And that's actually becoming important today in room temperature nanoscale transistors. The expression that I showed you on the earlier slide can be simplified at low temperatures to this simple expression for the conductance. 2q squared over h times the transmission at the Fermi energy times the number of channels at the Fermi energy. And the important points are that the conductance comes in quantum units, quantum of conductance, 2q squared over h. And that no matter how short you make the resistor, the resistance doesn't go to zero. The conductance doesn't go to infinity. There's an upper limit when t is equal to 1. Now, if we take that theory and apply it to the transistor, and this is the heart of the course, this is what we'll spend most of our time on, then we'll see that these simple traditional textbook expressions can very easily be extended to describe nanoscale transistors. All we need to do is to replace some of the parameters like mobility, which have an unclear physical meaning at these very small dimensions, by something we'll call an apparent mobility. And we will talk about what that is. It involves the real mobility and something that we'll call the ballistic mobility. And under high drain bias, we have to replace the saturated velocity by something that we call 
uh, the injection velocity, and which involves the transmission in the saturated region and a velocity that we'll call the ballistic injection velocity. Now, the shape of the curve is still the same as was worked out in the 1960s because that shape is largely controlled by manipulating these energy barriers, as I discussed earlier. But the actual magnitude of the currents are different because transport is different at the nanoscale. Okay, so that's what the course is all about. Our goals are to develop a simple physical understanding of how these devices work how these very important devices work, to understand why the functional form of the characteristic is so, simpler, so similar to what it was 50 years ago, and then to briefly examine some of the limits of device scaling and see where silicon technology may be able to go. So the course is five weeks long. We'll spend the first week with some introduction to transistors and defining some concepts, uh, a little bit about some essentials of transport, getting familiar with sketching energy band diagrams. MOS electrostatics is really important for a MOSFET, so we'll devote a week to that. And then we'll first of all look at the transistor that's ballistic. When electrons just fly across from source to drain, don't encounter anything that scatters them or alters their direction. Week four, we'll add scattering and talk about what happens when they scatter a few times between the source and the drain. And then we'll wrap up in week five and think about some things like what are the practical limits to scaling, making devices smaller and smaller, and what are the fundamental limits. Okay. So who should take this course? So I think many of the people taking this course will already have had an introductory understanding of MOSFETs and will be familiar with the first expressions that I presented, the ones that were worked out first in the 1960s and then extended in the 70s and 80s. But if you're interested in understanding how those concepts are extended and applied to the incredibly small devices that we have today, then this course is for you. Now, there are also many people that are working in areas like material science, physics, chemistry, that are working on various aspects of electronic materials and devices, and who need a basic, simple understanding of how these devices operate. So this course is also designed for those kinds of people. And for people that are working on maybe different devices that aren't aren't traditional silicon or 3-5 MOSFETs, but, but are nanoscale devices of various kinds, this is an interesting example because a transistor is a true nanoscale device and it gives us an opportunity to take a device that's been around for 50 years or more and to see how we treat the nanoscale device in a physically sensible and proper way. What kind of background are you going to need for this course? Well, I'm, we assume an undergraduate level uh, preparation in basic math and physics and a little bit of electromagnetics so you understand uh, things like a Poisson and Laplace equation. You'll also need a basic knowledge of concepts like energy bands, effective mass, Fermi functions, basic semiconductor physics. Now, I will try to review what we need for the course, but I'll also give you pointers to web-based lectures for those of you that haven't had a significant background in, uh, in semiconductor physics, but um, you'll be able, I think, to follow the course with the quick review that I provide and also with the pointers to some web-based resources. Okay, so that's what the course is all about. Uh, we're working hard to get ready. Uh, we're looking forward to it. I hope you'll think about being part of it. Um, we expect to have a worldwide audience, and if you're interested in signing up, visit NanoHub U. If you still have questions about the course, uh, drop me a line by email, and I'd be happy to answer them. So hope to see you in the course.